So tonight we're going to talk about um, starting your plants from seeds. And primarily we're going to focus on um, indoor plants that are seedling, start, seeds that you would start indoors and transplant out. Um, certainly you can plant seeds directly into the soil, in the ground, in your garden. Um, but you know that has some nuances that are slightly different from the indoor seedlings. And the indoor seedlings are typically a little bit more um, demanding in terms of what they need to start. And so that's how we're gonna focus um, our talk. And so we're gonna talk about uh, th considerations, things you need to think about when you're selecting your seed to start for seedlings indoors and um, you know, what kinds of requirements, what types of things you're going to need to have um, to make sure that you can grow some healthy um, seedlings. And you know, we'll take, um, Sue and I are, I, I should have started out with this, Sue and I are master gardeners with Kane County um, Extension. Um, and we uh, um, have done this, uh, this talk with the Aurora Library before. Um, some of you may have been at the seed swap that the library hosted at all three branches, EOLA, um, downtown and the West Branch, they hosted that last Saturday and made seeds available to the community. So Sue and I have worked with um, Janet at the library for several years in, in bringing this program to you. So um, hopefully you enjoy it. If you have questions, you can do one or two things. You can put them into the chat or um, we will have a couple breaks throughout the presentation and you can ask questions at that point in time too. You can you know unmute yourself and ask questions if you'd like to at those breaks. So um, with that in mind, we hope to have um, be wrapped up around 7.30. Um, so with that in mind, we'll uh, get started. Sue, did you have anything to say as we kick off? No, just welcome. Okay. All right, so as I mentioned, you know, the, the materials that you're gonna need to start your seeds are, are fairly minimal. And a lot of the things that you need to start seed, you can do with um, common things you have around the house. Um, so let's go, can we go to the next slide, Sue? So why start seeds from home? You know, I mean, there's some conventional thinking is because you save money. Um, you know, I, I would say that you can save money if you start seed from home. A pack of seed at say three, four, five dollars with maybe 50 seeds in it, sure is a lot less costly than if you were to buy four or five tomato plants and you know each one said you know was three or four dollars. You know, it is less expensive to start by seed. Um, you do have to think about the other things that you have put into your growing too, you know, in terms of lights and um, what time of growing medium and the containers and things like that. So, you know, it's really hard to capture what the true cost is of starting your seeds from home. But overall, yeah, I would say, you know, you can definitely save some money doing it. Um, another key advantage, and, you know, I mean, I, one of the, the main reasons I like to start my own seed, other than I get itchy and I like to do it and it's fun this time of year, which is another equally important to me, but um, I like to know the growing conditions. You know, if you start your own seeds from home, you can select your own seed, knowing if the seed that you have was organic seed to start with, you can um, make the decision if it was a hybrid or was it, is it an open pollinated? Uh, has, is it an heirloom? Um, and what kind of growing conditions has that seedling gone under? You know, oftentimes if you go to um, a nursery or a big box to buy your tomato plants in May, you know, like right at the time of planting, you have these big, you know, robust looking plants to put into the ground. Um, but what you don't know when you purchase them at the store is what, you know, what's gone into that soil mix, the potting mix, have they used some fertilizers, some types of chemicals. And if that's important to you, you I mean, you don't know what those growing conditions are. Also, I will also say a lot of the trans, the plants that you would purchase in a store are started somewhere else and transported. So they've spent some time on a truck and they might be slightly stressed, et cetera. So, um, you know, you can just have better control over your growing conditions if you start your seeds by yourself. You can start them earlier um, so that they are ready to go in the ground when we have that last frost. And, um, you know, so you're, you have a faster time to harvest them. 
Um, and you have a lot more selection in terms of what you can grow. Um, you can really pick some unusual varieties um, in this. So, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, those are some of the benefits for growing your own seeds. So can we go to the next slide? Oh, thanks, Sue. Um, so just a little bit to know about um, when you are selecting your seed, you need to know where you're at, know your environment. Here in Kane County, uh, we are growing zone 5B. And there's, uh, you know, there's several different zones throughout the US, but we're in zone 5B. Some seed package labels might say what areas it's suited for, most don't. But um, this is kind of important to understand your growing zone when it's time to calculate when you should start your seeds and when they can go in the ground. Because our frost, our last frost date might be drastically different than say if you were in a zone seven, grow, you know, what's that last frost date? So it's gonna be significantly different. So you gotta know your environment um, and know your seed um, suppliers. Um, you can often, you can get seed um, in local gardens um, that's, that you can't find in your local garden centers. You know, you can find them through um, uh, catalogs or seed companies um, as, or last weekend at the library, they had a seed swap. You could have found some unusual varieties there. Um, but, you know, think about what you want to grow and why you want to grow a particular seed. Let's do the next slide. So in, in looking at the seed packets, there's just a few things you want to um, keep in mind. And there is a lot of information that's important and relevant to starting your seeds on the seeds packets. I will say some uh, uh, seed suppliers are better than others. Some give you a lot more detail. Some don't give as much detail. But one of the things you for sure will find on the seed pack and most likely on the front of the seed or in the seed catalog, which on the far left, that's an example um, of a seed catalog. You'll see whether it's an open pollinated seed or whether it's a hybrid seed. And you might see for open, pollin open pollinated on the front of the seed pack, you might see that it uh, says OP, or in the case of this beet, you'll see that it says it's an heirloom, which is um, means it's, it's an open pollinated. So what's the difference between a hybrid F1, or you sometimes might just hear it referred to as a hybrid or sometimes just referred to as an F1, or uh, heirloom open pollinated. So F1s are uh, seeds that are crosses. They were crossbred and they were specifically bred to produce specific traits. So um, if you are looking for a specific characteristic, say the characteristic that you want is that it's to be uh, disease resistant. Um, breeders may cross a seed for a tomato to, to get that resistance built in, or they might cross the seed to get a big tomato, or they might cross for a specific color of the tomato. So it really, there's specific characteristics that are bred into that. Now, if you select a F1 seed, um, you know, important things to know about that are you're not going to be able to save that seed and be guaranteed that you'll, that your next generation of plants will be like your first generation of plants. And the reason is because it's a cross, um, a dominant trait might come through down the line as you save that seed. And it might make that dominant trait might make it less like the original. If you want to make sure that you're safe growing plants that are open pollinated, which open pollinated means that the seed um, crosses um, it from, and it's true to parent, like the seed, the next generation of seed is going to be true to the parent. An advantage of growing open pollinated seed is if you want to save seed, the next generation of plants will be like the parent plant or the original plant. Oftentimes in heirlooms, so all heirlooms, um, to be an heir, uh, to be an heirloom, um, it, it is open pollinated. So all heirlooms are open pollinated, but not all open pollinated seeds are heirlooms. You know that's confusing. To get classified as an heirloom seed, it had to been grown for forty to fifty years and passed on, and that's what makes it an heirloom. Um, but open pollinate, but all heirlooms are open pollinated. So. Um, 
and has a lot more, you know, in, in the heirlooms and open pollinated, it's, you know, uh, preserved genetic diversity um, and there's cultural tr traditions that are built into the seeds. So just be kind of aware uh, what you're selecting when you get your seed and if you want to save seed. And like I said, the advantage of the hybrids F1s um, is that, you know, there's disease resistance built into it. Um, and, uh, but you know, the disadvantage is you can't save your seed. Advantage of open pollinated is uh, you can save your seed. You might have a better flavor profile or better flavor selections. Um, and there's more heritage involved with the seed, but some seeds may not have that disease resistance bred into it. Organic is something else that you might see as you're looking for seed. And organic seed is a USDA designation. And is the, that means that the parent plants that produced those seeds were synthetic, they, there was no synthetic fertilizers, pesticides or fungicides used on that. So um, the seeds are usually a little bit more expensive, but if uh, you plan to garden using organic practices, um, you might have better yields if you use uh, organic seed. And, you know, obviously it might be more important for you to do that. Um, you can find seed um, in many different places. Um, you can get, there's many catalogs that I get a lot of catalogs and they start showing up at my door in December, um, all different kinds of seed um, catalogs. Uh, <coughs> the seed swaps. Um, St. Charles is having a seed swap. Aurora had their seed swap last weekend. Um, you can find them at nurseries, big box, retail, um, several different places to find your seeds. I would caution on seeds though right now um, that you might want to make sure that you get your seed early. Um, in 2019, or I mean, sorry, in 2020, uh, the year of the pandemic gardening, um, popularity really expanded and grew and everybody's growing gardens. And, you know, the, that increased demand for seed was felt on the supply chain for seed. You know, there was a, a lot of outages and out of stocks on seed in 2020 and even last year in 2021. So um, you might not want to wait too long if there's specific varieties or, you know, if there's something unique uh, that you're looking for, you, um, you might want to uh, get that seed selected. I know I put in an order for seed about three weeks ago and a couple of the things that I wanted were already out of stock. So don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that off. So um, can we go to the next slide, Sue? So when you have seed, um, you know, keep in mind how old the seed is. Um, you know, there are some general guidelines of how many years, and this longevity here is in number of years, how long seed will last, you know, this, um, recommendation says lettuce will only last one year. I, I mean, I can tell you, I save my own lettuce seed. So I get, I mean, above abundance amounts of seed because you don't have to grow much lettuce and save many plants to have seed that's just very, very productive. And, and you know, so I have, I have lots of lettuce seed. Um, I don't always use it up in one year and I continue to save, but I mean, I have used lettuce seed that's three or four years old, and I still have good germination. Um, the same thing with onions. I've used onions on the second year. The thing you need to keep in mind is if you're going to use old seed, and it's not to say that it might not germinate, but the germination rate might not be oh, as high. So for example, if you planted five seeds, ten, say you planted 10 seeds that of older seed beyond the, you know, like, you know, say it was like, expired, technically expired three years ago, and you planted 10 seeds, there's a chance you might only get five or six of them to germinate. So we would say that's a 50 to 60% germination rate. So this isn't to say that your seed isn't going to germinate. You're just going to have a lower rate of germination among that old seed. And you can always do a seed germination here, here. test yeah. at home. Um, can, can you put your phone on mute, mute, please, if you haven't got it on mute? Thank you. Um, so expect a lower germination rate if you have older seed. So this is just a general guideline of your seed. So uh, usually on every seed pack, there is a date uh, that it was what year it was packed for. So just check that seed date when you're planting. And if it's older seed, maybe, you know, maybe uh, use twice as much seed as you want or, you know, be very liberal when you're using your seeds. Okay, next slide, please, Sue. 
Okay, so um, I mentioned when we started off about whether you start your seeds um, indoors or whether you direct seed. And just this is just a guideline of um, seeds that are best planted directly into the ground versus those that are best started in the ground or started indoors. So things that you know do really better if you plant them directly into the soil in the spring are things like beans and beets, um, carrots, peas, potatoes, radish. And this isn't an exhaustive list, but just to give you an idea. In general, if the plants are cool season crops, those that you know grow and mature in cooler weathers and it, they can take a, a light frost, generally those things, those seeds do best planted directly into the ground. The seedlings that do better started indoors in general it's not, it's not necessarily only the case, but in general, uh, those that start better indoors are ones that are more warm season crops. And again, the advantage of starting them indoors is that you're getting them the growth started so that by the time our last frost comes in May, generally it's in May, sometimes it's in April, um, you know, their plants are ready to go into the ground and they've already um, started to mature some. So things like that would be peppers and tomatoes, eggplants, basil, um, if you, you know, planted warm season crops directly outside after our last frost for tomatoes, for example, you might not get your first tomato till even before, you know, we get our first frost in October and you'd be very close. So that's an advantage. So, and there's other things that you can either start indoors or direct seed. It's really whatever your preference is. You know, a lot of the vine crops, which include squashes and cucumbers, lettuce and greens, um, corn, onions, those can go either way. So we'll take some uh, questions at this point. If you um, have a question, you can um, unmute yourself and ask, or uh, if you wanna put it in the chat, are there any questions so far? Hi, Leah. Uh, Hi. This, is, this is Joe. Um, Hi, Joe. Where do you find your last frost date? Sue is going to cover that for us um, in the next section. Okay. And, um, you know, she's got some, some really uh, nice information also around our soil temperatures in, um, you know, in this area. So I'm going to ask if uh, you can hold that question for Sue and then if we don't answer okay. what you need. We'll come back to you at the next time we have questions. So the okay, question, Nick, you. yeah, Nick asks, are hybrid and F1 are equivalent? Um, yes, they are. So uh, typically on a seed pack, you will see F1, but they might call it a, a hybrid. And recommended seed catalogs for Kim, you know, there are so many out there. Um, I think it really depends if you uh, are interested in, um, you know, heirlooms and, and a lot of heritage seeds, there are some really good suppliers. So um, examples of those seed catalogs would be Seed Savers Exchange. Um, they're based in Decorah, Iowa. Um, High Mowing Seeds is another good supplier. They're based in Vermont. Uh, Baker Seeds in the more and Missouri has um, nice selection of heirloom open pollinated seeds. They're going to show you. And then, um, you know, there's certainly others. Can, can you put your phone on mute? Can you put your mic on mute, please, if, if it's not? Thank you. Um, if you are, you know, if that's not necessarily what you're looking for is heirloom and you want some more hybrids and more, um, you know, different selections that way. You know, there are endless suppliers, Johnny Seeds, um, Burpee Seeds, uh, gosh, Sue, am I forgetting any other one? Territorial. Territorial Seed. seed. Um, and that's not an exhaustive list. I mean, there's there's quite a few. Those are the ones I'm most familiar with. Um, All right, are there oh. any other questions? Can I ask one? Sure. Sure. Great. So part of what we're, we're hoping to get out of this presentation is just general advice. Leah, you shared before that you place orders for seeds, but then you also save lettuce seeds. 
So in your experience, and Sue, feel free to jump in, how do you distinguish for you what you buy versus what you save? Um, so <laughs> what I buy, uh, what I, I, I save, I have a, I save quite a few seeds. So for example, saving seeds can get more complex based on the variety. For example, I grow a lot of winter squashes. I grow usually like four different varieties of winter squash. Winter squashes have different, um, can't Sue correct me, is it called species within it or uh, the, like the pepo, right, they're, the they're muschata? Different. Right, they're different species, but they can cross pollinate. Right, so, so there's different, yeah. There's different species of squash. So I grow a butternut squash, which if I remember right, I think it's part of the Muschato species of squash. And I also grow uh, similar to like a delicata squash, which is a pepo squash. Now those are, and I grow pumpkin, which I don't remember what family pumpkins in, what species pumpkins in. I think it's Muschato. Is it? There's like several different uh, species. But some of those species can cross with each other. And so if I grew, a, let's say I grew a, grew a butternut squash and a, and a pumpkin, um, and I saved the seed and I was not careful in my seed selection, and by careful I mean isolating and making sure that no bees got in to pollinate or cross pollinate my flower, which I can't watch my flower all day long. And, you know, so that was, is, would happen. Um, the, the second generation of plants that I would grow would not be the same. Like it might be more dominant, like maybe my butternut squash got crossed with the pumpkin. So now my squash is coming out like something like a cross between a pumpkin and a butternut squash. So I tend not to save those kinds of seeds where the cross pollination can produce, or it's more tedious maybe to prevent cross pollination. So I tend not to save those seeds. I save um, my pumpkin seeds that I grow that are, uh, I'm sorry, my tomato seeds that I grow that are open pollinated heirloom tomatoes. I save my own seed. Um, some of my peppers <coughs> that I grow are heirloom and open pollinated and I'll save those. <coughs> Excuse me. I definitely save my lettuce seeds because I'm pretty much at like four or five lettuces that I really like. So um, that's just an example. I save my bean seeds every single year. Um, varieties that I like and I want to stick with those varieties and that are not too tedious to save the seed, I'll save the seed. So I have that as part of my inventory. And then I also, every year, I want to try new and different things. And there's other seeds, some seeds that are just too tedious for me to save, or I don't feel like going to the effort to save those seeds. So then I'll purchase them. Great. All right, are there Thank other you. questions? No, all right, so we'll continue on. But I wanna point out, we did put some information in the chat that um, we may refer to. So uh, there's some websites, some links to websites in there. So you might wanna take a look at that. So if you've decided what you wanna plant, now the problem becomes when, when do you plant, especially if you're, you need to start the seeds indoors. So I'm gonna talk about when you plant and I'm gonna talk about how you start seeds indoors and then Leah will finish up with transplanting to outside. So when you look at your information, that the information you need is on seed packets. So uh, you look in it, the example on the right, says starting indoors three to four weeks before the last frost date. Okay, so we'll have to figure out when the last frost date is. The one on the left says indoors six weeks prior to warm weather. So, hmm, is, what's warm weather mean uh, when the soil is warm? So we'll talk about that too. So it everything is dependent um, on what type of seed you have because a tomato seed will need to be started sooner than say if you were going to start a squash seed indoors. So look at the information on your seed packet is pretty much the rule of thumb. 
So now, how do you know when it's going to be the last frost date or last freeze? Well, you can look at the uh, state climatologist puts out maps. Uh, if you Google the state climatologist and you get a map like the one on the left, and that's showing you for different regions in Illinois. So we're in this medium blue region. So our last frost date is going to be the average around April 16th. Um, as you know, there is no such thing as an average frost date. You can have, we can have frost even into June. We can have it in May. You could have your last frost date in April. So it's not really a hard science about when to plant. It's almost like an art. Some people tend to use a date like Mother's Day as that will be the last frost date whenever I plant. They just pick a day. So you you can play around with it. You can, uh, if you start more seeds than you need, you can take a risk and put tomatoes out a little early, thinking that it's there's not going to be a frost date. If they get hit you and, or you can't protect them from the frost, you have more that you can replace with. Um, another thing that you can do is look at soil temperatures and plant when it's appropriate for the type of plant. So generally there are cool season crops and there are warm season crops. There are some that are a little bit like uh, semi-hardy, but we'll just call cool season crops. They can tolerate a soil temperature of 50 degrees, but warmer crops and the, and the cool crops would be things like kale, uh, spinach, Warm season crops, they need warm temperatures to grow. If you plant a squash seed and it's cool outside, the seed will rot. So if you want to know what the soil temperature is, you can get a, a kitchen thermometer, you can buy a soil thermometer, and you can put it in the ground. But let's say you don't have that or you just don't want to do that. There is a website you can go to which will tell you what the soil temperature is in Kane County, particularly St. Charles. That's our closest. So I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to uh, reshare and show you what the state map looks like if I could find it. Um, While Sue's doing that, the, the link that this um, soil site is on is in the chat box at the very top of the chat box uh, if you i seem to have lost that link uh i mean uh let me see if i can where it went on my i have to escape it. well you're not going to see you're not going to see that map you're going to need to go to that link and figure it out you're sorry uh I zoomed out of that one. But what that, what that website will give you is the reporting stations for the Illinois Climate Network. And there are about 10 to 12 different reporting stations in the whole of Illinois. And the closest one to us is St. Charles. And when you click on St. Charles, what you'll end up with is you'll end up with a soil temperature right at the moment now you'll end up what it was earlier you'll end up with yesterday's soil temperature you'll end up with soil temperatures that are at the surface of the soil you'll end up with them uh, below the soil so there's more information than you could possibly need but it's all there so sorry about that so knowing this you can now count backwards. So if it was six weeks is when six weeks uh, before the last frost date is when you're supposed to start the seeds, you know if you're going to use April 16th as the last frost date, which is pretty risky, you count back six weeks and that's when you start your seeds. So it's as simple as that. 
So Leah has a method here, which is pretty intense. And she'll talk a little bit about how she decides when she's going to start her various seeds. So have you got the, can you share the screen? Oh, sorry. I thought I was. <coughs> there. How's that? That's good. So this is like, you know, I, uh, Sue and I always laugh that we do so many things like we're like, um, you know, yin and yang or something like that, I guess, or, or the like odd, night and the odd couple We're the odd couple or <laughs> night and day, or, you know, um, this is the way I think about my garden and I, I like spreadsheets. So I always think that like when I need to make sense of something, I put it on a spreadsheet. So I've just, you know, taken my, all the different things that I grow, uh, be it herbs, veggies. Um, I have flowers on here as well. And when, how, you know, what the package, the seed packet tells me when to start the seedlings before the last frost date. Um, and I, I've kind of put myself a little bit of a calendar together like this to know when I should start different seedlings, when I should plan to transplant them in, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, you know, this is all hinged on what my plant date is going to be. And again, like Sue said, we never know. You know, we're sitting here on February 8th. We have no idea when our last frost is going to be or when the soil temperatures are going to warm to above 50 or to 60 or to 70 because some seed packets might say, uh, to plant at certain soil temperatures. We can't anticipate that, but I just use some averages and kind of work backwards on all my seedlings based on that. So this is, I will tell you like over the top and like there's much simpler ways to do it, but you know, I don't always take the simple route. Yeah. Well, I'll show you the simpler way to do it. And that's this. So I get a piece of paper and I'm growing kale and spinach and it's four to six weeks before the last frost date. I say April 27th and then it tells me when to plant. And then the semi-hardy, here they are. And then at last frost, corn and green beans and one to two weeks after last frost, tomato squash and sweet potatoes. So you can be like that. Or somewhere maybe in between the two of us is the right place to be. So now you know when to plant, you know what you're planting. Now the question is, should you start seeds indoors? And I, and we only say this because there is a bit of a commitment. You know, do you have the time to do it? And do you have the space? The time meaning you may need to start, actually, if you're growing, say, celery root, the times I grow that, I start that in January. So I am growing something for several months under light in my house. Do I have the space for that? Not really. It, it ends up in my living room. But you, you have a, a bit of a commitment to time and to space. So just, just be aware of that. Uh, you are going to need a few things, and if you have never done indoor seed starting, it's you're going to put out some a little bit of money to start with. So yeah, a calendar, it doesn't have to be a dedicated calendar. Permanent markers and labels, oh yes. Your watering, water rubs off pen and even pencil, and then you don't know what you have. So always label. You'll need a light source. I'll talk more about that. Uh, we keep, Leah, you keep yours on a timer. I keep mine on a timer. Yeah, it's I do. It's just easier that way. You need some type of containers with drainage. We'll talk a little bit about that. You need a medium to start the seeds in and uh, you don't want to be using soil from outside and, and we'll talk about that. And a small fan to circulate air to reduce disease. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The, the Probably the most complicated thing is going to be the lighting. So can you start lights in a windowsill? I mean, sorry, can you start seeds in a windowsill using sunlight? And the answer is, well, sure. You People always 
you know, can start something in there. You start those tomato seeds in a windowsill, they're not getting a whole lot of light. They'll still grow. You probably won't get the yield that you would have gotten if you grew, you know, healthy plants under an artificial light. The sunlight coming through a window is just not, not really the most optimum light for starting seeds, but people, people do it and, and some are happy with that. But so the two main types of lights that we're going to talk about are fluorescent lights and LED lights and LED lights have really just come, become so popular in the last few years. Uh, so I, I just started, I got my first LED lights last year and I'm still, uh, messing around with them to try to figure out what's optimum. So the what we call the, the fancy term photosynthetically active radiation, the colors that plants like from white light are red and blue. So that's, that's what you need to, to know. Uh, you, if you're going to buy fluorescent tubes, you have to make sure that they're going to have light in the red and blue range. So let's talk a little bit about that. You probably have heard, you know, fluorescent lights come in like a range of colors, like cool colors, daylight, what have you. So their color is actually in a number and it's 1500 to 800 K. So when you go to your local hardware store, you need to make sure you're buying fluorescent tubes that are in the right range of K. So you want to have what would be called one that is a daylight, which is the 5000 to 650 K. And you want a second one that's going to be in the warm range, which is the 2700 to 3000 K. So the daylight one is the blue and the warm one is the red. So that's if you have say a holder that'll hold two bulbs, you could make it easier on yourself and buy what's called a full spectrum light, but you have to make sure that it covers that full range and includes the warm red region and the daylight blue region. Or you can go even further and buy a grow light, which will be in the red and blue range. The grow lights will be a little more expensive than buying the plain fluorescent light. So if you're on a budget, you will want to be buying more of just like a shop light. Okay. Um, as far as the LEDs, they are going to be the LED for grow lights. They're now pretty cheap and uh, the, the issue with them, and, and they'll, you can see this is a picture of one, they will put out a really purple, purple type of light. Uh, they are so new that uh, Illinois Extension has not really put a lot of information out about that. So we have limited information and you have to rely on what the manufacturer is saying, like how far above the plants it should be. We know with fluorescent lights, they should be no more than say two to three inches above the plants. They have to be that far or that close to the plants because they don't have a big outlet of light compared to the sun so it won't burn the plants being three inches above. But an LED light has a big output. Those need to be anywhere from eight to 18 inches above your plants. So you need to have a system, no matter which type of light, that you can raise and lower the light as the plant grows. But all we can say with LED right now is you have to follow the manufacturer's recommendations for height and you may need to do some experimenting with that. As far as time, we know that for fluorescence, 14 to 16 hours a day is optimum. 
I've known people who say would do two shifts on their plants. They'd put one set of plants in at 6 a.m. and then at 6 p.m. they'd take those plants out and put a second set of plants under their light system. So that was a way they saved money, but they, their plants were only getting 12 hours, so they were a little slower. You should rotate plants on a fluorescent tube. The ends tend to wear out first. So you'll notice if you don't shift your plants and you have uh, bulbs that are a couple of years old, the plants that are on the edge of the light are smaller and not growing. So you need to rotate ones into the center and put the center ones out. For the LEDs, again, all we can say is probably needs net less time and may not need to rotate plants. So there's not a lot of information about them, but we're, we're doing experiments. Leah, what have you found with LED? You have the uh, LEDs that are not the purpley type of LED, right? Right. So yeah, I am experimenting. So I have a, like just a, my uh, light is like a shop light fixture. And I've always grown with just shop light fluorescent bulbs that you can get at the store. Um, you know, any hardware store has, has them. Those are the bulbs I've used. Um, I did use full spectrum bulbs. Um, so there is a LED that will retrofit into a fluorescent, a, an old CFL fluorescent fixture. Um, and that's the long, it's like 48 inches, I believe long. Um, I did replace those last year. And, um, you know, one thing I will say about LEDs versus fluorescent, I have all my plants in the basement and I'm in an older home and it's a very cold basement. You know, my basement's around 55 to 60 in the winter. Um, it's not warm at all, which, you know, that's really not warm enough for my ceilings. So I did note with my LED light bulbs that they do not put out the heat that the, the fluorescent or the CFLs put out. And it really, you know, my plants need that heat. I need extra warmth in my basement because it's so cold. Um, so I am, so I switched to my warm season crops and I, I am using the, the CFLs, the old like shop, you know, light bulbs. I did though this winter because I, I also grow um, greens in the basement um, throughout the winter months because they're cold season and they can take the temperature in my basement, you know, 55 to 60 is okay. Like, you know, um, microgreens for arugula or radish or peas, they'll grow in that temperature. They don't have a lot of heat requirements. So I've switched back then to my LEDs for growing things in the winter. I've found that, um, 10 inches is too far above. To have a space of 10 inches, I'm not getting enough light. My plants are getting too leggy. So I'm experimenting with my LEDs and I'm probably at about six inches um, above my plants. And that seems to be kind of my sweet spot right now. Um, I don't know, I think in the spring when I'm starting my warmer, my, my seedlings that require more warmth though, I'm going to go back to my, my old fluorescent bulbs. So, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard to, to know. And then I don't know if there's so much standardization with a lot of these LEDs. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying some now too. I'm, but I have an even colder basement than Leah has. Mine's at about 45. I've got kale started and I have had kale. I have it on a heat mat. I've had kale growing in there now for for probably four weeks and it's an inch tall which is pretty small but the lighting is okay the the leds are are doing fine with it it's just more the temperature so still we're still experimenting so you can have different ways of of having them set up like you can have the shop lights and you can have them on a chain and you know, with a holder and roll them up as the, as the plants grow. This again shows you, this is what my basement looks like. It's, it's this, this kind of color and the plants look this color and I have to take them out from under the lamp 
the light to see if they're healthy because they, you know, they're red. I don't know. Are they, are they okay? You can also buy setups from uh, different supply places that are expensive, but see, they'll have the holder here and you can raise and lower this light. This is a double decker. There's a holder for the bulbs here that you can raise and lower. And it's got a, a stand and they're just, they're just really nice, but you're going to put out, you know, at least a hundred dollars for a small one like that. So again, if you're on a budget, getting a shop light is, is easy. And if you want to build a um, holder for the light, there are uh, a lot of directions on the web for PVC pipe holders for your, your grow light. So besides the light, then you need other supplies. So I mentioned the fan to circulate air so that you don't get too much humidity, which increases the, can the chance of molds that can affect seedlings. The timer is just a super great convenience because then you don't have to worry about running up and down your basement or wherever to turn the light on. So containers, there are many different types of containers out there. Uh, I tend to like, a, there's a system that's a self-watering system because I'm lazy. So it has the, the plastic uh, pack of either nine or, or something like 16 or so holes in it. And it rests on a wick that goes down into the water. So I just have to check that every, well, like once a week, if I don't have a heat pad on it and just put water in the reservoir. So I never have to worry about watering. It's, it's the lazy person's way, but it does need to have drainage. No matter what you use, you need drainage so that you don't uh, suffocate your plants because without air, they need air to grow in the soil. So plastic types of containers, some people like these, uh, I don't even know what these are made out of. They're not peat pots, but they're some type of uh, pressed, oops, let me go back, a pressed material. Um, um, some people say they like to use eggshells. I could never see that because you are ending up transplanting into something larger. I like to start with a larger size so I don't have to transplant seedlings. Leah, do you ever transplant seedlings into a second container before you put them outside? Uh, yes, I do. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, but um, yes, I do. Uh, I, I okay. often start all my seedlings in really small little plugs and then um, pot them up. Right, see, I'm lazier. And I don't, I don't plant as much as Leah does. I, I have a smaller garden, so I don't, I don't do massive quantities. So then I said before, don't use soil. What you should use is something that's a seed starting mix. So here it, it'll say seed starting mix or seed starter, but if it says potting mix, you don't want that. So for various reasons, one reason is potting mix is coarser. It'll have little pieces of sticks and things in there. So that's not, that your seedlings need to have, you know, a good, a, a boost when they start. They don't need to compete with, with big particles in their container. Also, they don't, seedlings don't need fertilizer to start with. So most of these generally don't have fertilizer in them. So uh, that's another advantage. When you look at potting mixes, they'll have fertilizer that's suitable for a mature plant, and some of them will even have water retaining beads in them and things like that. So they're, those are not good for your seedlings. Um, so I think that's all. So are there any questions on, on this section? You can put them in the chat box or ask, or you can save them for the end even.
I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I have, uh, I'm just, this is all new to me. So I just uh, bought an LED. Um, if you can see that, it's just very small. I bought two of these and mm -hmm. I've been growing some plants and nothing's really died yet. And my question is, is that, is it really, how important is if I keep the light, is, am I doing damage by keeping the light on all the time? Am I doing damage? What, you have it on 24 hours? Yeah, yeah, it's easier just to keep the thing on. And it's an LED thing. What kind of, what, what plants are you growing? Uh, uh, plants? Not exactly. Or I'm really into herbs, so oh. I um, I was I'm growing thyme, rosemary, and dill, and um, so the, the, those are the three. And I I confess that I only started the dill from seeds, and that was just a happy accident because I thought it was all dead and it just popped up. And uh, so I was just kind of like wondering if they're all under the lamp, which is right over there. I have two of them. But I was just wondering if it does any harm. I don't care about the electric bill. I just would like something to grow um, if I kept it on all the time. It's well, an LED. You know, all I can say is plant, I don't know that. I don't know the answer. I know that plants do uh, have light independent reactions that occur when there isn't any light. But I, I think those occur even when there is light. So if they seem healthy so far and you're not having any problem with them, then you can probably leave them on. Leah, do you know any more? Um, I, I don't know a lot, um, but I do know that there are plants that absolutely have to have darkness to grow. And I don't know if that's true of the herbs that you listed, mm -hmm. but it's more likely that the plants I need dark mm -hmm. at least eight hours. Um, mm -hmm. I know that I know of people for a fact that have, um, they live under a street light mm -hmm. and uh, they can't oh. grow things in their yard because they don't right. get darkness. Right. So I grew again, up under I can't a speak light. to your plants, yeah. but I'd say it's more common and more likely that a plant needs darkness okay. to be a healthy thriving plant. Okay, thank you. Then right. I will start yeah. turn, up, turn it off when I go to bed. Right, because yeah. flowering, like uh, poinsettias, um, I, I grew up in a, in a place where they grew outside and, and we had a street light and the poinsettias that were close to the street light never bloomed. So they were getting light all the time. So there are some, you, mm -hmm. you would have to, I mean, you could put that, you could ask that question to the uh, Master Gardener help desk, mm -hmm. naming your species, like mm -hmm. I have thyme, I have basil, and somebody could get back to you okay. with those plants specifically. But you know, it, if you can turn it off and turn it back on, that would I be- I can. I'm just that, lazy and forgetful. Oh, you, get a timer. <laughs> it has a timer. <laughs> it has a timer? Yes. It oh. has a timer, I, but then I have to read the instructions. <laughs> well okay. thank you thank you so much all right well you're welcome so i saw in the chat there was a question about what's the best way to protect plants from frost uh after uh we move the plant outside and and that would be covering it with something uh bed sheets uh if you don't have the special uh Cloth, whatever, what's that cloth called from growing? The frog, yeah, the um, row cover. The row covers, row covers. Uh, but you can use sheets. Uh, you could cover with uh, some type of a big plant pot you have, just something that keeps the, the frost off. And then, then there was another question about uh, what kind of safety buffer do you add to the last frost date? How many days do you add? Huh? It depends. Depends on my mood. Uh, I, I'm getting almost to the point where I just go in the first week of May because 
instead of into April for like the tomatoes. You put the tomatoes out early, they're just going to sit there. They may as well be under your grow light and be growing. Uh, you know, unless you're you're one of those people that does things outside to heat up your ground and there's all kinds of things you can do to speed your tomatoes up outside, but we're not going to talk about that. Leah, do you have anything, what you do? Well, you know, I've buffer? pushed back um, from on my tomatoes over the course of years. I've probably pushed back my start date by three or four weeks um, because my tomatoes were getting too big. And, and in, that, in the same time period, our last frost date has moved up. I, I mean, it's, you know, it's earlier than it used to be. Um, but my tomato plants were, were just getting so big and, you know, I don't, I don't personally want to have too much growth in my tomato plants. I mean, I know people go to these nurseries or hardware stores and they see these big, beautiful tomato plants and they want to grow those. I run away from stuff like that. I, the plants have harder time adapting once you transplant them. I prefer to have them somewhat on the small side. So I've pushed back and, um, you know, I'm, I'm like, I, I'm, I kind of go in my mind with tomatoes. I used to say like in my mind, just for planning purposes, regardless of what the last frost date was, I'd always say, I want them in by Memorial day, but honestly anymore, I'm like, I have them in by May 15th always. So, um, I can't, you know, it, it, I mean, the way that our, our temperatures are varying so much, I can't really <laughs> tell you what to do. <laughs> yeah. All right, are there any other questions? Oops, I did something. Just push. Okay, so now it's 7.30, so we are going to speed through the rest. Yeah, we have, I saw Nick have another question of, do you cover up um, your seedlings with something like clear plastic? I do that in my basement, yes, because it's so cold. Um, I put uh, plastic around it. I have a neighbor who has a, he just has some rack from like a you know a hardware store or something and he has a fluorescent light on it and he bought a war a wardrobe bag like a clear wardrobe bag and he puts that over there to have kind of like a, a growing station that's you know it traps the heat in but yes i do just take a sheet of plastic and i use it's very um you know it's very rustic i put two clothes pins on the end of it to clip it shut and it does really it does keep trap the temperatures you know i get about five more degrees by doing that if i haven't done it so yes i do thanks for for asking that so let's talk about indoor planting so what do you do you know sue talked about the soilless mix you want to make sure you buy soilless um that mix has a really hard time holding on to water so i would recommend that you put some of your planting medium in a bucket and wet it and kind of work it with your hands a little bit, like almost, you know, like as if you were uh, kneading dough or something. And when you've got that soil mixture nice and wet, but yet when you squeeze it, you don't want water to come out. That's about the right level uh, of wetness that you want in there. And that um, moistened seed mix um, should be, you know, pretty good to get you through the whole germination phase. So you put that into your containers, um, follow the planting depth that's on your seed packet. I started um, coleus, which is a, you know, it's like an ornamental foliage um, thing I put in pots outside. I started my coleus and that seeds packet says it requires light to germinate. So I just put the seed right on top of my soil mix and I have it in a sunny window because that's enough sun for it to germinate, not to grow once the plant germinates, it's going to have stronger light requirements, but to germinate just in a sunny window is fine. Um, your package might say it requires light. Basil is another seed that requires light to germinate. Those are the you know rare exceptions though. Generally, like a tomato seed or a pepper seed or a squash seed, it'll tell you how to sow it. Like it might say a quarter of an inch deep or a half an inch deep. Just you know, follow the package instruction. Um, and then just gently, you wanna uh, press in um, the seed and make sure that there's good contact between the soil and the seed itself and label it and don't, um, you know, you'll be tempted not to label it. You think you might remember, but you won't, especially if you're growing different varieties of plants. Label it and it's helpful if you put the date on there. And while they're 
you know, going to, before they germinate, I like to put a cover on it here. This is in, a, in this photo. Um, I've got like a dome with this one little tray, but I also um, will use just like a piece of sometimes like a, a loose piece of saran. I don't wrap it real tight, but I might just lay it over the top of my soil, um, of the, the soilless mix to, um, to create some kind of humidity while I'm growing. There's a question. Uh, okay. Um, so the next slide is uh, what we need once we germinate. You know, um, seeds will germinate at different temperatures. You know, ideally you have 75, somewhere between 65 and 75 degrees temperatures to germinate. Um, if you're starting these in the house and they don't require light to germinate, you know, an ideal place to put your, your trays, if you have room, is on top of your refrigerator. And that generates some nice warmth and that's like a nice temperature and, um, you know, would, would provide the, the, a, a good temperature to germinate your seeds. Um, warm se season uh, seeds tend to like it warmer. So things like the warm seasons are eggplant, tomatoes, peppers, basil. They like warmer temperatures um, and cooler season plants like kale, spinach, lettuces, onions, they can take cooler temperatures to germinate. And even if you have lower temperatures and you're planting tomatoes, it will germinate. It's just gonna take a longer time to get that germination. Um, now I will, you'll see on the right over here, um, this is a picture of uh, some seeds I started last week. And I have um, that black mat underneath my seed tray is a, is a, a, a germination mat that's sold just for that purpose. And it keeps, you know, it's just like about 75 degrees on that mat and it provides warmth for um, the, the germination or, you know, for the seeds to get germinated. Um, and then just check daily. Some seeds germinate quite quickly. Other ones take a longer time. It just really depends on what you're growing, how hard the seed coat is of the seed. Um, check your moisture though every day. Um, you know, I keep a spray bottle handy. Um, you don't want to like water these with under the tap or with a watering can. That's just gonna be too much water. If they do dry out, which it's not likely that they will, if you have a, you know, some kind of cover on them, they should retain enough um, moisture to germinate. But if they do dry out, just give them a spritz with some water. Um, and then when you have 80% of your seedlings are germinated, in other words, when you see little, um, like, you know, sprouts coming out of the seed, then you should increase your light to the requirements that it needs. So if it's the 14 hours a day, get it under the, that light or, you know, and, um, as the plants grow, make sure you are keeping that space between your light. If you're fluorescent or CFLs, it's, you know, three inches and it seems close. I know that seems really close to have your plants that close to a, a CFL light bulb, but it, it really, your plants are fine as long as it's CL, CFL. Like Sue said, the LED is a little bit less um, scientific or known at this point in time, but not as close as a CFL. Um, if you want, uh, when, the, when your plants um, or when your seeds germinate, the first set of leaves that you'll see there, they're called cotyledon actually, they're not really leaves that first set of things that looks like leaves is just the seed coat breaking through. After that, like then in your second set of what looks to be leaves, but really is your first true leaf, we call that the first true leaf. When that begins to appear, um, I usually pop my plants up or at least thin them at that stage. Um, if you've planted a couple seedlings or a couple seeds in each little pot, and you have all, let's say you put three seedlings in and they all, seeds in and they all have grown and you want to thin that out, you should cut those back with the scissors. Do not pull them out because you're going to disrupt the roots and you might cause some damage to the neighboring seedlings. So just cut those extra uh, plants out to thin them. <coughs> but I like to pop my, my seeds up. So on the left is where my first, these are peppers that I grew. And you'll see that my first, it's hard to see, but my first true leaves are starting to appear on here. So then I pop them up like as if in the middle here. And I'm potting up to a bigger container um, to give them more room to expand and to grow. 
And then this last picture is hardening off, which we're gonna talk about in the next slide. Um, Sue, if we can move forward. So after your seedlings uh, grow and, and now you're getting a couple weeks before you want to transplant or when you think, I know Nick, um, we, we wanna know when that last fraught state is, but we don't, but like two weeks of what your estimate of when you think you might be planting is, is a good time to start hardening off your, your seedlings. And by hardening off, we're just really starting to condition them, condition them or get them acclimated to being outdoors. You know, these seedlings have been in for maybe six, maybe eight, maybe, you know, four weeks in your house in a pretty protective environment. When we put them outside under the, the sun and under the wind and, you know, different conditions outside, it's going to be, you know, much um, harder for them, I mean, you know, to survive. So we want to phase them in, get them used to that um, over time. So um, to harden them off, you know, when you first take them outside, put them in a sheltered area. If you have a covered porch, I know Sue does, she puts her, her plants out on her covered porch, put them there or, or, you know, maybe put them on a shaded part of your house or by your back door that's a little bit protected from wind maybe, um, and just leave them out for the first day for a couple hours. And then just increasingly day by day, increase the amount of time that you leave them out and also increase their exposure to direct sun. And then, you know, maybe we have a windy day and maybe they'll get increased to, you know, to being out for all day when it's really windy. It's just helping them adapt um, more slowly. So it's not so shocking all at once. And um, here's a couple of different ways I harden stuff off. In the top picture, I, I have a window an egress window in my basement. And if you have one of those, those are fantastic. Um, you can use them as like a, a mini cold frame to start getting your plants uh, more accustomed to cooler temperatures. Um, you can put them under, you know, like a, a greenhouse or some people use a, a window, you know, propped up on some straw to create kind of a cold frame effect. Or here Sue has hers on her front porch um, and, you know, somewhat of a protect, protected environment. Um, just be sure to bring those seedlings in at night, um, the first few nights. But if we're going to have really bad temperatures, for sure, bring them inside. Um, so getting, uh, Sue, can we go up one more slide, I think? There? And, uh, one more. There? Right there. Wait, which way? Back or right. forward? No, that's it. Go. Um, Okay, can, I think we've got, yeah, right there. Okay. I'm sorry, can you go up two more slides? Wait, back? You mean where to? Yes, yes, this one? back. Two more slides. This one? One more. That one? Yes, this one. So, um, so your plants have been hardened off. You're ready to transplant them. Um, <laughs> you know, things you need to think about are your soil and make sure that your soil is healthy. Um, it's always a good idea to amend your soil with organic matter and, um, you know, do a soil test if you're so inclined to see what your soil nutrients look like. But have your soil prepared to go you want to plant on a day when the moisture is, is um, you know, when it's not too wet and when it's not too dry. Um, you know, you want it to be uh, just, just that right sweet spot of soil moisture. Um, you can loosen your soil either by till or no till. I have a picture I'm going to show you in a couple slides down of um, what not to do. I have gone to a no till garden. Um, I've uh, destroyed my soil structure using a, a till by tilling my garden. And I've really found, I've been doing no-till now for like seven years and my soil is far superior by no-till. So I don't till. I know a lot of people do. Um, you have to be very uh, careful of when you plant and when you till, um, if you do go with till, because you can really uh, damage the soil structure if you till, if it's too wet or too dry. Okay, can we go to the next slide, Sue? Um, also know the sunlight that you have on your garden. 
Um, most plants, um, you know, fruiting plants such as peppers and tomatoes, eggplants need eight to 10 hours of direct sun. Your leafy greens and your uh, cool season plants can typically take less sun, things like um, kale and spinach. They have less direct sun. So just follow the sun in your garden between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. to see when your garden receives full light. Okay, can you go to the next slide, Sue? So this isn't my example, like I said, of, of, of what I did one year when I tilled. Um, it's hard to see in this picture probably, but like my soil is just clumpy and horrible and hard. And it's just like not nice at all. Um, I tilled my garden when it was too wet to, to be tilling that year. And it just resulted in really poor soil that I couldn't really even recover that whole growing season. Um, so just make sure you know, your, your soil moisture is right when you transplant and um, that your soil is, is holding together. And, um, you know, when you transplants get in, you want to water your plants. In fact, it's a good idea before you transplant, like the night before or the morning of that you're going to transplant into the garden, water your seedling plants really well um, so that they are not, you know, going to be at all stressed in the, uh, in the transplant and so that they'll come out of your container nice and easily. Um, just make sure you water those well. Uh, follow your spacing guidelines recommended on the, on the seeds. You know, it is really easy in early May to look at the tomatoes and think that two feet planted or 30 inches is you don't need that much space. Maybe I can fit three tomatoes in the same space. By August, you'll be kicking yourself if you do that. So really follow the package guidelines on spacing for your plants. Um, it's really nice if you can plant on a day that's overcast. You now that sun can be really harsh and, and uh, be stressful for the plants um, if they're transplanted out in full sun. If you aren't gonna have an overcast day, it's nice if you can do it um, later in the day, you know, when the sun, like maybe four or five, when the sun isn't directly on the garden, um, it just makes the um, adjustment and transition to the garden that much easier because the sun can be kind of, it's stressful for the, the seedlings or the first couple of days. If you get some cold weather, and you know, we talked about protection, um, you can use a row cover, you can use a sheet, you can use a milk jug, you can use things if we're going to get some cold weather or, you know, frost is, you know, likely, um, you know, protect your plants at night. And then after your plants are established, you know, just mulch them. It really uh, it will save you in terms of having to water, uh, weed suppression. It'll put organic matter back into your soil. So using whether it, if it's leaves from last fall, if it's mulch, um, if it's straw, it's really helpful if you can get some mulch down on the ground. So with that, I'm sorry, we went a little bit over. Uh, we're gonna have to wrap up here in a couple minutes, but are there questions? I've got one. Um, my family has drunk the Kool-Aid of the no-till garden, yes. but the raised garden beds that we have is in shade and we need to move them, which means effectively, we are going to be tilling the soil just by transporting it to a different location of our yard. You kind of alluded to that there might be times that tilling is less harmful. And I, I think that would help me. Do you have any, like, can you point me in the direction to find more information about that? Um, I would say by less harmful, I mean the soil moisture. So there's a sweet spot of when to till um, you don't want it too dry and you don't want it too wet. Um, that's what I was referring to in terms of being less harmful um, is what your soil moisture content is. So, you know, I would not till, but, but you're saying you're moving raised beds. How are you going to, I guess I'm, I don't, I'm, well, I, are you, I, my thought is I'm trying to be conscientious of the microorganisms in the soil themselves and right. I, I don't want to disrupt them more than I have to, but knowing that the garden beds have to move, those microorganisms will be disrupted. So, yes. you know, like I can, I can artificially soil, uh, water the soil and, and try to make it a good level or, or not. And 
you know, hit that, that target. Um, but you know, if, if I have to move the soil, it seems like those, those microorganisms are going to be, uh, you know, broken apart no matter what. Yeah. They're going to be disturbed for sure. Um, but if you're just, you know, if you're just shoveling and moving the soil, that's not going to be as harsh as tilling really. Um, so, I mean, it will change it and they'll be disturbed. <laughs> Um, I, so when to do that, I would, I would just, um, not do, do it when it was too wet. That would be my biggest concern. I don't know, Sue, if you've got anything to add to that. Right. Cause I, I grow in raised beds and, um, I, I tend to think of my raised bed as a, as a big flower pot. So I, I don't till, but I don't really do no till either. I, I mix in my compost in it uh, with a shovel and you know I figured the microorganisms are there I don't have a problem with with what I grow but yeah the wetness that's the problem because it's the same with you don't want to step on a wet bed whether it's raised or not raised you don't want to compress the soil that's the big no-no Thank you. There are other questions? We have raised beds, four of them, a four feet by eight feet, about two and a half feet tall. Um, what is the percentage you recommend of mixture of compost to soil to sand? I never yeah. put sand in, in mine. Um, Leah, would you add sand? We did a third, a third, a third, and had a very productive garden garden beds this year, but I did not keep going. What more do we add? I, I think just adding organic, if you've got a base that works of soil mixture, I mean, I, I don't use sand either, um, mm -hmm. but if you, have, if you had success this year and, you know, that's great. And then, but you know, the plants that you grew depleted some of that soil because they took nutrients up right. from that soil. So it's depleted, you know, a good um, practice, a gardening practice for any gardening, whether you're, you know, in a raised bed or whether you're in the ground is to add organic or organic matter every year. Um, okay. And, you know, every growing season to make sure you amend your soil. You can do that in the fall. You can do leaves. You know, there's many ways you can amend it, but to do that every year. Okay. Um, you know, general guidelines, if you were to have a formal soil test done and you sent a soil sample into a, a testing company, you know, kind of the target number that you would want to be at for your organic matter would be about 10%. So, 10%. yeah, so I don't, you know, know what that means for what you've got now. Um, but I would say that if you, depending on what you used as your organic matter, you know, you might want to have at least an inch to more that you put on top of your beds this year, just to get more nutrients in there. Okay. Because your plants are, your plants take up nutrients, you know, it's, so right. it's got a, it's a cycle. It has to keep being replenished. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Well, uh, this has been, um, Fun. We're going to, Sue and I are going to be also going to uh, do another presentation with the library next month. Um, and that is going to be on March 8th. And we're going to be talking about composting. So um, Judith, if you are looking for organic matter to add to your garden beds or any of you are, and you know, you want to start to think about, um, you know, composting some of your kitchen waste and some of your yard waste, on March 8th, we're going to do another presentation like this on Zoom through the library on composting. So with that, I don't know, um, Janet or Sue, any other comments? No, thank you all for attending. Yes, thank you. Very thank informative. You. Thank you. And, and again, any questions? This is information here on the uh, Master Gardener Help Desk. You can email your, your questions in. Uh, it will open in march for in person so uh, not yet but you can always call or email 
your gardening questions in. Good. Well, Good luck with your growing season. Yes. yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you.